Let's talk about treating anxiety. The first thing that I like to think about with any child with an autism spectrum disorder who is either clearly anxious or who is having behavioral challenges are the sensory issues, okay? And I think a lot of times we don't pay enough attention to this. Interoception refers to um, those receptors inside the body that, just, that help us to understand what's going on physiologically inside of us. So if you're having, for example, distension of your abdomen because you're chronically constipated, there are receptors that tell your brain that that's happening, okay? And you feel uncomfortable, okay? A lot of times kids with autism spectrum disorders don't read their internal physiologic signals very well. So if they're constipated, if they've got a tummy ache, if they're, they've got a crick someplace, they don't read those very well. Um, and so the first thing that I ask somebody when somebody's behavior is going south is, what's, is he sick? Does he have a cavity? Does he have an abscess someplace? You know, is there something afoot here? That needs to be completely ruled out. I want to describe to you a study that's, been, that's in process right now, and if you want to enroll your child in it, um, Elstein at USC.edu um, is one of the co-authors on this. Um, the Department of Occupational Therapy and the Children's Hospital Dental School have um, recognized that going to the dentist is a traumatic experience for a lot of kids with autism spectrum disorders and a lot of people in general. And so what they did was they created an altered sensory environment for those kids. So they did things like um, no fluorescent lights in the room. The, uh, the doctor wears, the dentist wears a headlight that shines a light only into the child's mouth. Um, light, beautiful light patterns on the ceiling. Headphones with music. They got rid of the smells. When the child needed to be, have you guys seen a papoose that the, what they use to hold a kid down? You know they're awful. So they created this um, butterfly restraining device that actually holds the child to the chair, but it doesn't have that flat board at the back of it, so it's more comfortable. The child can get themselves out of it, um, so they don't have that feeling of being claustrophobic or contained. So they complete, they really did a lot of work to change the sensory environment, and this study is still ongoing. So if your kid needs dental work, and you want them to be in an environment that's nice, um, contact her, because she's looking for people. And I think that this is an example of where, in my opinion, it's okay to alter the environment. Why wouldn't you? You know, this is something that happens, you know, twice a year. Um, it's stressful for a lot of people. It's hard to distract yourself when somebody has their hands in your mouth. You know, and I think that to to change the environment makes perfect sense. I'll give you another example, not for kids with autism, where some very smart person decided to change the environment. Back in the 80s, when I was a resident at LA County Hospital um, in the neonatal intensive care unit, um, babies were lined up in um, incubators, okay, little isolettes they call them. So it's a plastic box, basically. I don't say this with pride, I'm just saying this is the reality. This is what it was. The lights were on 24-7. Phones were ringing. There were alarms going off because if there was a, a delivery that we needed to run to, blah, 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 like that, you know, you had to run for it. I would leave a 24-hour shift like this. I didn't understand what was going on. I didn't know that this was a sensorily overwhelming environment. All I knew was that, you know, I felt like having a drink and smoking at 7 o'clock in the morning. You know, it was that stressful. So one woman, her name was Tiffany Field, she was a labor and delivery nurse or a NICU nurse. And what she did was she said, this doesn't make sense. Let's change the environment. Let's make it so that it's, it's dark a lot of the time because that's what the baby experiences in the womb. Let's not let these fool doctors handle these babies morning, noon, and night. Let's have handling times where they're allowed to do noxious things to the baby during those times. Let's change the entire environment of this place. And what they found was is that those kids were discharged from the hospital a week early. That's $100,000 per child. That speaks to the medical community, all right? So I guess my point is, is that sometimes adapting the sensory environment is not only good for the patient, it's good for the economy. You know, it's good for getting what you want. My office is not in a traditional medical environment because if I had an office in a doctor's building where it smelled like whatever they smell like, and where little Johnny is screaming next door, 
I would get nothing from my patients. And the need to spend two hours with somebody screaming, first of all, stresses me out, and it, it, I get nothing from the child. So I changed my environment to look like a house, and it isn't, it's an apartment, because it feels better for the child. So that's the way we have to think, you know? Um, a lot of times in schools, sensory integration is kicked to the curb once a child hits school age. That culture is changing a little bit. For those of you who have older kids, I'm pretty sure that was probably their experience. That is changing. But they thought sensory integration problems were like a preschool problem. And after that, you were fixed somehow, all right? Um, that's not true. And I think the school environment is a place where changing the sensory environment could make a huge difference for students being able to be successful. And I don't think it would have to be changing the world to accommodate them. I think a lot of kids would benefit from an environment that was more attuned to calmness and being more comfortable. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about is using sensory input to help with state regulation. A lot of people don't realize this, but um, and a lot of occupational therapists don't, don't think about this, but the way we calm ourselves down when we're anxious is physically. Since we experience anxiety physically, we can also help anxiety by giving our body physical input. Think about it. Swinging. People have been swinging since the dawn of time. Think about people doing things like this, or people um, putting things in their mouth. What is a cigarette but an attempt to kind of soothe yourself, right? I go like this, I jiggle my leg when I'm trying not to cry. I have no idea why that works, but it works for me. So I think that there are some occupational therapists around that understand the importance of giving people sensory tools to help them manage their anxiety. And that should be part of the toolbox of any parent with, a child, with an adult with special needs is helping them to understand that you can use your body to help you regulate yourself, okay? Um, right. So cognitive behavioral therapy, switching gears completely. <clears throat> cognitive behavioral therapy is the treatment of choice for children with anxiety disorders. And if that is ineffective or not sufficiently effective, then you can add medication. Cognitive behavioral therapy um, can be, uh, really requires somebody to be cognitively intact. And it is very helpful if they have some ability to communicate. I have some kids in my practice with autism with very bad OCD who are nonverbal functionally, but who communicate by typing with an iPad. And those kids can do cognitive behavioral therapy. But they need to be, there needs to be some sort of interchange, all right, for it to work. And basically what it is, is it teaches you to be aware of your feelings, your negative thoughts, to evaluate them, and then come up with some, some way of changing it. So for example, if you're feeling anxious, a cognitive behavioral therapy therapist might say, okay, how are you feeling? Oh, I'm feeling anxious. On a scale of one to 10, how, where's that anxiety? Okay, it's a, it's a seven, okay. Let's come up with three things you can do to get that anxiety down to a different, to a better level. And they work with you on strategies to bring it down. They also help you to evaluate the reality of the situation. Like if you're anxious about, you know, a car crashing, you can you can use, you know, data to help you understand the real level of threat. Or if it's something that you don't want to do that's making you really anxious, you can talk about cognitive restructuring. So for example, Instead of saying, oh God, I have to get up and exercise, I hate exercising, it ruins my day, blah, blah, blah. You say to yourself, I get to get up and exercise because I get to have a healthy body and it's going to improve the quality of my life. So it's about shifting things. There have been some people, uh, Jeff Woods at UCLA has modified traditional cognitive behavioral therapy techniques and has found um, and works with kids with autism spectrum disorders who's in the anxiety clinic. But the improvements when you look at multiple studies are not that great, 20 to 50%, so modest. I like this one. Um, 
in pediatrics last year, they published, and this is not for kids with autism spectrum disorders, but treatment of best practices for anxiety uh, for children in general. And psychoeducation, so explaining to the child what's going on, cognitive behavioral therapy, and then medication are seem to, what seem to be what works the best. Um, I looked up some things that I thought were kind of interesting, because one of the things that I'm always concerned about is how much money it costs to take care of a kid with special needs, and how much time it takes. And especially if you have other kids, and you're trying, you're taking them to this therapy and that therapy and all over town, it's exhausting. And I think it's really a drain on people's resources. Not only that, there aren't necessarily that many people who are highly trained in working with kids with autism spectrum disorders. So in England, you know, they're all about saving money. And they did um, a, a study where they did a parent-delivered cognitive behavioral therapy using a workbook model and some parent training. They had good results with that. There's also um, this other study that did an internet-delivered cognitive behavioral therapy where the parent was supported by a therapist online. And they found some efficacy with that. So I think we're going to start seeing more and more logistically more acceptable ways of helping kids with autism by helping parents. So here's something that's interesting. I want to talk about parental anxiety and kids with ASD. Um, it's really hard if you have an anxious child um, not to experience some anxiety oneself. And what they, in this particular study that was published in 2017, they found, not unexpectedly, that when the child did well in treatment, parental anxiety decreased. And the question they raised is, could parental anxiety be a factor in treatment non-response? In other words, if parents are highly anxious, are the kids more likely to be anxious? Now, I want to be very careful with this, okay? Does anyone here, or has anyone here ever read the wonderful works of Dr. Bruno Bellheim? Or know who he is? Yeah, okay. So I first encountered Dr. Bellheim in 1970, when I was in high school. And his um, idea was that autism was the result of refrigerator parents, parents who had no emotional connections to their children. And this was a common belief for many, many years, blaming the parents. So I want to be very careful here not blaming parents, okay? That is not the point here. I think the point is, is that as parents, we have to look at our own response to our child's behavior and their anxiety and work hard on managing our own anxiety. When a child is anxious and escalating in their anxiety, if you join with them and escalate with them, nothing good happens, okay? So the more anxious or dysregulated a child becomes, it becomes necessary to become calmer and calmer in itself. Did I say this was easy? No, okay? I think this is one of the hardest things that parents do, is trying to keep yourself contained when a child is escalating. But I think it's a really important thing to do, and frankly, um, that's why I think that parents of kids with special needs need a lot more support than they're getting from people who can help them learn how to do these kinds of things, because I think they'll be more effective um, with their kids. Um, I like this one. This is a video game. And this was developed in the Netherlands. And I looked online to see if I could find it, and I haven't found it yet. But basically what they tried to do is they tried to simulate a scary experience for kids with autism and help them to learn how to calm themselves down. And what they did was they, they used EEG monitors to, me to measure what was going on with their arousal levels. And then they gave them things to do to help calm themselves down while they were playing a video game. So here's the scenario. I'm not sure I approve of this. Little Arthur's parents leave him on the doorstep of a scary mansion. That seems not nice to me. I don't know. <laughs> Arthur must use his inner strength to overcome his fears so that the shadows in the house hold no power over him. He must use his mind light, a light bubble that shines on his surroundings and can be controlled by his inner strength. And the inner strength is measured by a neurofeedback headset that the child weighs by playing the game. 
and the gaming session is led by a therapist or a master student, and then they master various levels, and it's all about him confronting his fears and calming himself down. I think this is fascinating. This would be an awesome thing for your people to develop, I'm just saying. But, you know, I mean, I, I think that something like this, given that, I mean, you know, kids are so video game nuts, you know, and I think something like this is just another tool that could help with learning how to recognize what's going on physiologically in your body and calm yourself down. And I think that given that this was such a, a small amount of time and that they saw some positive results, I think it's kind of exciting. So this is something that maybe something like this could be helpful. All right. So these are parent training um, programs for disruptive behaviors. These have not been designed for kids with anxiety, all right? But since anxiety can manifest itself as disruptive behavior, and since as a parent, I think we're always looking for new tools, new tricks, new things that we can do, all of these um, are uh, validated and, and useful in helping children, just neurotypical children with disruptive behaviors. They're accessible online. There's not, you don't have to go out, you don't have to pay $200 an hour to a therapist. I personally think that these are all things that are worth looking into and that might be helpful to, um, to help channel disruptive behaviors in a, in a more positive way. Um, exercise and anxiety. Have any of you read the book Spark by John Rady? Okay, this is a guy that wrote, he co-wrote with Ed Hallwell a book called Driven to Distraction. And it's about ADHD. It was um, it's about the, um, ADHD in adults. We used to think that ADHD was only um, in children, and then he and his partner said, no, no, it carries on throughout the lifespan. It's a classic for ADHD literature. He wrote a book called Spark, in which he looks at the neuroscientific evidence behind the efficacy of exercise as a treatment not only for ADHD, but for anxiety and depression. I was completely. Uh, excited by this, you know, because here's something that's cheap, that you can do at home, and, it, you know, it's good for the child's cardiovascular health as well as for their emotional health. Um, if you look at the, um, the meta-analysis meta that's been done on exercise and cognitive and mental health in youth, um, the data is mixed, okay? So you're not, his data is much more skewed in a positive direction than people that didn't write this book. But I personally think that if you have a child that you can get to engage in vis vigorous physical activity, that it will help their anxiety level over time. The problem is, if you have a child who's not an exerciser, how do you get them to do it? And I totally get that. And sometimes I have people start with like three minutes a day. Three minutes a day of exercise that raises your heart rate, whatever that looks like. And it has to be something fun and interesting that the child enjoys. But and then gradually build up. And the culture of the family needs to support it. We're all exercisers in this family. This is what we do. This is for our health. We all do this. Um, again, it's cheap. All right. Pediatrics last year published. Um, reviews of mind-body therapies for children and youth. And all of these have been shown to have various degrees of efficacy for kids with anxiety as well as ADHD, sleep problems, and other physical health issues such as asthma and gastrointestinal problems. Um, I am a firm believer that a mindfulness practice is the best thing in the world for kids with anxiety. And that can be a physical mindfulness practice like yoga or tai chi or martial arts. It can be um, guided imagery or meditations. Um, biofeedback is um, a technology that's been around for a very long time and that in the hands of a responsible practitioner can also be very helpful in helping people understand what their experience is, what their the physical experiences of anxiety and give them tools for kind of calming themselves down. The problem is finding somebody that's a good practitioner. There are some people out in the valley that I like, the authors, I think are very responsible clinicians. And there's a guy in Pasadena that I like, not a fan of the Drake Institute. Um, but I think um, it could, these can be helpful things, especially for people who do not want to walk the medication path with their child. All right, so let's get
get to medication. Um, there are only two SSRIs that are approved for use in children, and those are um, and those are the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, Zoloft and Prozac. So they work on the serotonin system of the brain, and they work like this. So this is neurotransmitter number. This is neuron number one, and inside there are little vesicles that contain neurotransmitter. When a stimulus hits the axon, goes through the axon and gets to the end of the nerve cell. It releases the neurotransmitter into this space, and then the neurotransmitter binds to receptor sites on the next neuron down. The body, being amazing, recycles any neurotransmitter that does not get bound up to receptors on this site. And what the SSRIs do is they temporarily stop that recycling process. All right, it's not permanent. Temporary only while the medicine is in your system, and then. What that means is there's more neurotransmitter hanging around in this space, so more potential for them to bind to receptors over here on the sound. So the idea is, is that the, trans the, the nervous transmission will be more effective. Um, so one of the things we don't know is there's not any research on long-term use and efficacy in the developing brain. So I have little tiny kids in my practice that are on Zoloft or Prozac. Doesn't make me happy, but they're not functioning. They're not happy, they're miserable. And we've tried everything we can think of, and this can make a huge difference. Um, in teenagers and adults, I think that there's a pretty good safety profile on these medications, personally. Uh, personally. Um, when I start with these medications, I use doses that most psychiatrists think I'm doing fairy dust instead of doing real medication. I'm talking about tiny, tiny, tiny doses of medication. And oftentimes something like 0.1 milliliter might make a huge difference for a child when the usual starting dose would be maybe 10 times that. Um, some kids on these medications get activated. In other words, they get agitated and they, it looks neurological. They're just they, they get crawling out of their skin. It's very difficult to watch. You don't know if that's going to happen. Um, also, these medications have a black box warning, which means there is some potential for suicidal ideation. So when a child or an adult is placed on these medications, you have to be aware of that and watch for that. Generally speaking, though, these are the first-line treatment for anxiety. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, we use things like Ativan. Um, not, I don't use these things chronically. Uh, these are in the benzodiazepine family. If a psychiatrist, some psychiatrists use them um, commonly and frequently. I use them only in situational things like Johnny has to get on an airplane and he's terrified. Okay, and we've done the airplane training thing, and you know, so we'll give him the Ativan just to make sure that he can get on the plane. Um, if kids have a lot of behavioral dysregulation, if they're very tantrum prone, medications like clonidine and guanfacine. Um, are very help, can be helpful for that. A different mechanism of action from the SSRIs. They're old-time antihypertensive medications that nobody really uses for high blood pressure anymore, but they can't, they've been used off-label for a million years for uh, behavioral dysregulation. They can also, clonidine can also be useful for sleep because it makes you quite sleepy. Um, the idea is not to sedate the child. The idea is to just calm down so they can function. The only uh, difficult thing, as with the SSRIs, is you can't stop these medications cold turkey. Um, with the clonidine and guanfacine, because they do have some impact on blood pressure, uh, you have to wean off them, otherwise you can, you know, your blood pressure can go like this, which is not a happy circumstance. With the SSRIs, um, my experience with kids is that I really haven't had much difficulty with getting kids off of these medications. Many adults in my practice have told me that when they've been on and then go off those medications, that it's horrible, that they feel terrible, that they feel anxious and depressed and just completely messed up. I've never had a kid tell me that, and I've had some teenagers that have just stopped cold turkey, and they come in to see me three weeks later, and they say, hey, I stopped my medication, and I'm like, what? You know, but they, um, I, I've never had it be an issue. But that being said, my standard of practice is to wean very slowly off these and I think that's what most people would recommend. Sleep is a common issue for people with autism, and people with anxiety often have problems with sleep. Clonidine can be helpful for that, melatonin at reasonable doses, 
and trazodone, which is an old-time uh, tricyclic antidepressant that um, I don't know if anybody uses it for depression anymore, but it can make you sleepy. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing about it is that you don't generally feel hungover the next morning. So um, with clonidine, some people feel hungover. I, I can't take melatonin because it makes me feel horrible. But everybody, you know, it's basically it's trial and error with these medications to see what works. All right. The selective serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors um, are not approved for use in children. Once you get to be 16 or so, you can start using a lot of medications that are not FDA approved for use in children. Um, Pretz Prestique and Cymbalta and Effexor um, are medications that I know a lot of kids in my practice have been on and done very well on them. I didn't prescribe those medications, but they work very well. Atomoxetine is Stratera. Stratera is an interesting medication. It is actually um, for, um, FDA approved for use in ADHD. It's not a stimulant. It's not like Ritalin or Adderall. Um, and its effects are not as dramatic. They build up over time. Um, and it can be very helpful for people with ADHD who also have anxiety. So it's something that I use not infrequently with kids on the spectrum. As with all medications um, who have ADHD, I don't use it to treat anxiety, but I use it if they have ADHD and anxiety, then they're on the spectrum. I found it can work very well. Um, the bad news about Stratera is it tastes vile. You have to be able to swallow it whole because it is nasty. I mean, I guess if you don't care what things taste like, you could, you know, it's nasty. The other thing is it's really hard on your stomach. Some people, even if they take it on a full stomach, just get a horrible stomach ache and they just can't tolerate it. So you have, you know, some people have a delicate stomach, you know, they throw up and, you know, you just have to know your kid, you know. Um, Buspar is not FDA used, approved for use in children, but it is an, an, a specific anxiolytic and some people find it very helpful. I, again, I don't use it because I don't treat adults. Um, the atypical antipsychotics, um, most of you have probably heard of Risperdal or Risperidone and Abilify. Um, neither one of those, both of those are FDA approved for use in children with autism, but neither one of those is like notorious for its anxiolytic effects. That being said, I have found that for some kids on the spectrum that have anxiety, sometimes an atypical like Risperdal or Abilify can be very, very helpful. But it is not recommended as a first-line treatment of anxiety. I, you know, I use Risperdal and Adilify sparingly in my practice because of the metabolic consequences of those medications. They're not, you know, obesity is commonly seen, insulin resistance, prolactin, nerve secretion. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that goes along with those medications. But if you need it, you need it. Um, and then Lyrica is not pre-FDA um, approved for use in generalized anxiety, but some people think that it can be helpful in adults not a first-line treatment. Um, some people are asking me about CBD oil. I didn't put it up there. And it's use in anxiety. Um, the only literature in pediatrics about CBD oil is for seizure disorders and for the treatment of chronic pain. And in both of those, it appears that there is a use for CBD. All right? So I think that's a, that's a blessing. That's a good thing. There's nothing in the literature that supports using CBD oil for anxiety. So when people, sorry? What is oh, it's cannabis. It's the, uh, it's, a, oh. it's the, yeah, they take out the, um, the, 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 you know, the journey part, the, the hallucinatory the part. The THC. The THC. And uh, it's supposedly it has beneficial effects. Now, people in my practice are starting to use it from time to time, and I'm, I'm waiting to hear what they see. So far, I've got an N of three. <laughs> So, not enough people to make a statement. Has yeah. it been studied? No. Uh, so, I, I don't know that it, we, sorry. We did use it for my son when we were trying, getting him off of Zoloft when he was little. To try this, because we had to drop the dose every two weeks super slowly to get him off because he was having seizures. It came up. So, it, it seemed to kind of help a little, but. To my knowledge, nobody is currently studying yeah. CBD and anxiety in children, or specifically in children with, uh, with autism and anxiety. But I mean, I'm, I was just talking to a psychiatrist friend, and he was aghast that people would do that. And I'm thinking, well, I'm not aghast. I don't know if it's going to work, but I, you know, I think it's kind of, 
you know, it's an interesting thought. And especially, you know, kids on the spectrum, it's like they haven't read the book about how they're supposed to respond to medication. They just don't <laughs> respond like other kids do. And um, unfortunately, it's very difficult sometimes to find the right combination of medications or the right medication to treat their problems. You know, every once in a while I'll pick a medication and it'll have a wonderful result and, you know, I look good, people think I'm great, that's awesome, everybody's happy, right? But a lot of the times with these medications, it's trial and error. There is a cheek swab test that we do now that can look at um, mitochondrial DNA and it tells us which metabolic pathways that are genetically determined are active in an individual, and these are the pathways that the body uses to metabolize various medications. Um, it's cool, it's neat information, but I haven't seen that it is necessarily life-altering in terms of how I practice or what I do. Um, I don't think that kids with autism's different responses to medication necessarily has to do with how they metabolize the medication. I think it has more to do with their brain chemistry and that we just don't understand what exactly is going on. But I personally think that for people with anxiety, lifestyle is just as important as medication. And I think that's true whether you have autism or not. That you have to find a way to live that helps you be calm. And you have to use things like mindfulness or yoga or exercise to help you deal with your anxiety. And our job as the grown-ups in these kids' life is to help them build resilience in the face of anxiety-provoking situation, but to try and to try to alter those situations when it is reasonable to alter, to help them be calmer in their lives. Um, and that this is really important because there's stuff going on in their brains and in their bodies in response to all of this stress and anxiety that is not healthy. It's not good for them. And that's it. Anybody have any questions? Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. started working with kids on the spectrum, there was nothing out there. I mean, this was like 20-some years ago, and it was bad. It was a waste in terms of trying to figure out services and get things together. And now I see that things are better in that regard. I think there's still a lot of confusion about, there's still a lack of quality, and there's still confusion about what, what therapeutic interventions are the best for a child and a lack of rational conversation about that. But now what I'm seeing as the problem is, as my patient population has gotten older, is where are these kids going to live and where are they going to work? And that's what I'm really passionate about right now. I think that as a community, we all have to stand together. And that's why I'm so enthusiastic about Exceptional Minds, because you guys stood up and did the right thing. It's really exciting. So anyway, that's it. Thank you. Right, thanks, guys. Thank you.